Good morning. I welcome you all to the investors call of Apollo of Invest India Limited. This is the uh, third quarter and we'll be discussing the financial results, the uh, what and not going on in the company for the third quarter for December 2023. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Mikhil Inani addressing our investors and post, and post that Ms. Diksha Nangya, our, C our CFO and whole time director of the company. Uh, meanwhile, I would request you all to drop your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, Mikhil, would you like to take over? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Prachi, uh, for setting this up and uh, very excited to meet all of our investors. And, you know, as we like to do in, uh, you know, all of our investor calls, uh, this is largely about, you know, you guys. And obviously, we will be sharing some updates about the company and some of the interesting stuff which has been going on. And in talking about some of the stuff that we said in the last investor call and how, you know, we are seeing that actually happen in the quarter that we're talking about right which was you know a lot of the stuff that we said in qt q2 actually is happening in q3 so that's quite exciting those things so you know like you said any specific questions please you will getting some updates after we him largely just interacting with you guys and our in you know where we are headed because you know internally at least we are very very excited about uh, you know how things are shaping up to be and you know uh, we expect obviously uh, future quarters to as well uh, you know go um so so basically without any further ado uh, let me maybe switch it to um diksha and you know we'll take it from there yes. thank you for that Mikhail. uh morning everyone what i'll be doing is i'll just give you a quick update of what we've been up to in the past quarter i think Mikhail has given you some sort of introduction maybe he can elaborate on all the points i'm going to tell you right now uh so those few few Quick updates for what happened last quarter. Uh, I'm sure you've realized our AUM has uh, gone up three times. Uh, and, and, and what we've been doing this past quarter is we've actually given a lot of term loans to NBFCs. A lot of partnerships with NBFCs have happened per se. One thing we realized is post these guidelines, um, a lot of um, regulated entities are what we realized we could scale with. And... Uh, in whatever fashion we could establish partnerships with them, be it in the form of a term loan or in a co-lending fashion, co-lending being the long-term play here, we've started to establish those contacts in this quarter. Uh, and this is why you're seeing uh, you know, a bump up as far as our AUM is concerned. We're hoping and expecting that number to increase uh, in the coming quarter also. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed our revenue is has not increased to the same degree that uh, it was uh, expected to consider in our AUM. But that's primarily because our uh, AUM increase just happened in the middle of last quarter. So we're hoping to see the fruits of those uh, come in in the coming quarter also. Um, another thing we've realized is that, of course, post the guidelines, it's only better and more scalable for us to work with um, regulated entities. And that's been our endeavor in this quarter and even the coming quarters. We feel they're more seasoned players. They know how lending works better than maybe LSPs. Not that we won't be working with LSPs. There are a lot of good, amazing LSPs out there also we're still currently working with. But it's just that um, it's a more scalable option for Apollo to work with NBFCs rather than uh, only work with LSPs, which is what you were doing in the past. So that's one shift in um, the way we've approached our lending. Uh, but one thing I can tell you uh, for sure, after having worked with so many regulated entities in this past couple of quarters, is that we realize and we've still, it's doubled down on our uh, thinking that um, tech is definitely our key strength here. Um, and we've realized that a lot of NBFCs find it very difficult to start partnership with other regulated entities that are not uh, very strong when it comes to their technology but clearly apollo's key strength when it comes to tech is helping us out there it's helping us start our part 
partnerships way faster it's helping us scale better because um, you know a lot of teething issues happen both systems have to be integrated just to give you a more detailed overview of why systems need to integrate is because in a co-lending arrangement both nbfcs need to have the same loan aligned on both ends and that's where we realize that our tech and our systems are really helping us uh, make this partnership run smoother so clearly uh, you know what we've been building from a tech standpoint is helping us and to double down on that we are also expanding our tech team uh, we are hoping to have a lot of new members join our tech team in this coming quarter also um the next update is from a hiring update because that's the next big thing that will be happening this quarter i know we always talk about hiring as an update because that's a continuous thing for us the polo but another key differentiator this quarter would be that we're targeting a lot of senior folks to join apollo uh, we realize that our industry has reached a point where there are already people who've been there for the past 6 7 years that the fintech space has been around here uh, and we realize that we can now hire people from this space already who've been there and done that and uh, we want to use that experience that people have had in the industry to take apollo to the next level So yes, these two key updates. Um, I think I'll let Mikhil elaborate on them further, and then maybe we can start with the plan. Thank you so much. Thanks. Right. Um, so that was a you know good I think overview from uh, Diksha on a lot of stuff which is happening. Obviously, the exciting stuff you know just to highlight it again is basically number one you know the the AUM ramp up which I think we had also spoken about you know in in the last quarter as well, right? That we had mentioned that. um you know now the time is kind of up for us to um you know taking it slow uh, we were expecting you know a large ramp up and i think you know uh, some part of that i think has already happened with obviously the the 3x jump in aum i think uh, in the coming quarters as well we will continue seeing uh, you know a decent rise in our aum i think all of that kind of um, goes down to basically a lot of the leg work which has already been done in establishing you know some of the really solid partnerships that we have right now with uh, you know some of the best lenders you know we believe uh, which are there in the ecosystem a lot of them fit you know uh, the kind of criteria that we have which is you know uh, people who are basically already lending at scale uh, know what they're doing by actually us being able to thoroughly examine their financials and you know making sure that you know they have the same uh ethos as us in terms of you know um uh, the unit economics to be you know very very simple right like looking at you know other uh, profitable nbfcs that we can work very very closely with who you know value tech as well and that makes us into uh, you know perfect partnership from both perspectives right and you know this is what happens essentially you know uh, from our perspective we we kind of notice that uh, because of obviously the amazing technology that we built uh it gives us a lot of priority in terms of you know getting them as partners and at the same point in time it gives us pricing power as well to not only obviously uh, you know get um attractive you know rates for the technology that we build but also the capital that we are providing and also puts us in front of the kind of uh, people that they want to get on do integrations with because you know obviously in the tech space right time is critical right go to market is critical uh you know people don't have the patience to kind of wait for like 5 6 months 7 months to kind of get into integrations and make sure all systems are kind of going people want to do this in a couple of weeks right if they can and if and when that happens it really really kind of changes the game from their perspective because it really almost like uh, you know gives them exactly what they want uh, from a partner right and a partner who is technology very uh, technologically very very strong uh makes uh, that relationship that much more sweeter so our ability to go fast and you know provide amazing technology continues to obviously be a very very important factor for us um uh, you know the second big thing i think uh, which obviously diksha mentioned again is you know um i think a lot of the team members that we have right now are fantastic for us uh, you know in terms of you know getting us to where we are today and i think they will obviously continue contributing extremely heavily to you know whatever success the company is going to have over the next you know many years right but i think for us to uh, go from being a good company to a great company right which is what we really want to do i think uh, we now need to hire in my opinion two to three uh, you know uh, people uh, you know across the company across different verticals 
uh, you know, and try to look for people who, you know, can help us basically go to the next level, right? And and from a next level perspective, I'm looking at, you know, people who obviously have relevant experience, but at the same point in time, I think uh, now is again the right time to do this because very honestly, we couldn't do this, you know, a few years back, right? Because at that point in time, if you were looking to get, uh, you know, quote unquote experienced people into the company, you would largely get people who have traditional uh, you know, uh, traditional financial services experience, which obviously has its pros, but I think it has a lot of cons, which is basically, you know, it puts people into kind of a traditional way of thinking. And if that's their career, it's very difficult for them to break out. I think given the fact that, you know, digital lending has matured and now, you know, it's been almost seven, eight years since uh, it's been pretty active, uh, you know, it's been a pretty active space, right? I think what's really happened is, a lot of people have by default educated themselves really well in this field over the last seven, eight years, right? So, you know, I feel like very frankly, right now is a good time for us to dive into this space uh, and, and and see if we can, you know, get some really good talent on board with relevant experience uh, with a very clear mindset and understanding of, you know, uh, what the present and the future of, you know, digital ending can look like, right? And, and really basically help us, um, you know, go to the next level. So, yeah, these are the two big things, at least, which come to my mind. One is, again, the AUM, you know, bump up, which I continue to foresee, you know, uh, for the quarters coming ahead. And at the same point in time, you know, fortifying the team with some, you know, two or three key hires across the board. Um, these are the two big things that I kind of, you know, see uh, going forward. Um, now I'll kind of pause, right? I'll pause and, you know, we will kind of address many of the questions, uh, you know, uh, now. So that you guys get a chance to actually ask uh, whatever it is that you want to, and we can take it from there. Thank you, Mikhil. Thank you, Diksha. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, we'll be moving ahead with the questions. Uh, we have question from Mr. Nitin. Mr. Nitin, I'll be unmuting you so that you can ask your question yourself. Mr. Nitin, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Right. Hi, Mikhail. Uh, hey. Mikhail, once in a time you have said that Swiggy and Zomato is using our platform for digital disbursement of loan or for their digital partnership. Is this still in place? No, that was uh, that was an example that we had given. Uh, you know. Uh, and and at any point in time, Zomato and Swiggy have not been using our platform. Uh, but this was just an example of, I would say, you know, platforms that you know we envision uh, will inevitably get into digital lending. Uh, because again, I think the thesis that we've kind of mentioned on our blog is, I think, you know, stronger than ever today, where you know more and more companies are thinking about unit economics very strongly. And if you don't basically, you know, put finance into these platforms, right? I think uh, they will kind of struggle to get to the kind of profitability numbers that, you know, I think uh, all the investors today, you know, expect them to be. Should we go to the next question, Prachi? Yeah. Yeah, let's move ahead. Uh, I'll be unmuting Mr. Puneet. Mr. Puneet, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, my first question is uh, why we are listed only on BSC and not on NSC? Yes, and any other questions? I'll answer both of them together. Yeah, yeah. In uh, in your annual report, I see uh, a purchase of a residential property amount 2 crore 75 lakhs. So I want to know the reason why we have purchased this property and last question is where we can find the AUM number you are talking about. Got it. So I think uh, to answer your first question, uh, why BSC and not NSC, I think, you know, uh, the answer is pretty simple. I think we had listed, uh, the company has been listed since I think almost 30 plus years at this point in time. So I think at that point in time, the BSE was a lot more popular than the NSE. So I think, you know, back then, very frankly, I think that's how my dad decided to do that. And, you know, ever since then, we've been listed on, you know, only uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange. 
uh, so i think you know that's some uh, perspective on that i think uh, to answer your next question uh, regarding the flat right i think this is more to do with uh, you know uh, basically i think this is this is not something which is a recent transaction you know at least to my knowledge this must have been a legacy transaction which is uh, almost uh, honestly uh, prior to you know me and diksha basically running the show right so i think it may be something to do with that uh, but you know one of the things you must have noticed over the last you know 6 7 years of us doing this right what are the legacy transactions we have we have been liquidating all of these uh, you know all of these assets over a period of time because you know our business is very very clearly wholly and solely only into you know digital lending right so uh, if there are assets which are you know remaining at this point in time uh, you know i foresee over the next few years as in when we get the opportune time to exit them you will see you know those exits happen and that money being deployed towards lending so uh, so that's a little bit about that i think to answer your question regarding you know the aum right uh, you should be expecting this uh, you know expecting the exact numbers by sometime next quarter because i think the balance sheet has not been updated this quarter but uh, next quarter you know uh, the aum will become you know publicly available um, so that's that's how you can think about that okay thank you thank you so much can can i ask one more question yeah of course yeah in this uh, quarterly report i see that fee and commission has been reduced as compared to previous year quarter so did yeah. we lost some clients or what's the reason i think the reason is uh, what we kind of mentioned in the previous quarter as well right like a lot of the stuff that we are expecting right now is that you know uh, we're deploying a lot of our capital so essentially what happens in this case is that when we deploy a lot of our capital i think the interest income is you know uh, rising in in exchange of that right so i'll give you an example of sometimes you know uh, what can be included in you know uh, fee and commission as well right sometimes you know partners because when they work with us right they have to make like a 12 month commitment with us and in these cases sometimes they commit for capital which they may not be able to utilize but in that case they end up do paying you know they end up paying us fees right so that comes under fee and commission but you know at the same point in time if those partners end up utilizing the capital right like which is you know actually us lending together that actually comes up in interest so if anything i think it's a sign that all of our partners are you know going all guns blazing and basically you know actually lending very strongly with us where you know most of the income which you know which may would have come in fee and commission is now coming as interest income because that shows that you know partners are basically um basically properly live with us and utilizing the capital that they've committed you know to utilize rather than you know just signing agreements and being in a situation where you know because they committed for capital they're just paying you know sometimes uh, the the commitment fees for it all right all right thank you so much that's all from my side all right thanks puneet thank you so much puneet uh, moving ahead we'll be taking questions from mr matthew mr matthew um, you can unmute yourself in the last call call uh, you were telling right maybe for future you might take uh, debt uh, from the other institutions right to scale up and in this uh, uh, this one i mean the pnl i've seen interest expense uh, as, as one of the expenses so have we reached that state that our capital is uh, completed and we have started taking debt from uh, other let's say banks or npfcs to scale up our business not yet uh, you know i would expect that to happen extremely soon though so uh, you know that is going to be a very pertinent conversation you know for us pretty soon right? i would expect probably in the next three four months that uh, an important basically question to get kind of uh, you know important uh, agenda uh, important item on the agenda basically right uh, because that, you know i think the speed at which uh, you know the aum is uh, you know rising essentially and you know i think it's all a function of all the hard work which has been done i think in the last couple of quarters to get us you know in a position where we feel we have uh, you know very very positive uh, partners with whom we can you know uh, scale up 
uh, in a unit economics positive manner, right? I think uh, all of those benefits we're going to be seeing, I think we started seeing that very frankly, um, you know, even just to comment a little bit on, you know, the revenue and profit numbers, right? I think, uh, you know, Q3, I think is just a sign of, you know, uh, what's to come in quarters ahead, because I think realistically the ramp up also happened, uh, you know, very much towards the end of the quarter, right? Probably in month three, uh, to be very uh, honest, right? So I think we only saw uh, some kind of benefits, right? A very small amount of benefits in terms of the bottom line in Q3, right? I think a lot of the benefits we're going to be seeing in Q4, and I think Q4 will also be a, you know, uh, a good place for us to basically see, you know, uh, a further rise in AUM essentially, right? So I think all of those things basically mean that I think pretty soon uh, we should be uh, deploying, you know, more or less 100%, you know, of our equity and, you know, starting to absorb some external debt as well pretty soon. So yeah, I'm expecting that to happen, you know, uh, very, very soon. Yes, uh, Michael, but I see an interest expense component in the expenses, right? That's why I was asking, what is that interest expense component? And also, is there any way that you can add the AUM also, like somewhere in the p and Like, I see it always from the LinkedIn post that you share, right? I mean, is there any other way that you can add? These are two questions. I mean, what was that interest expense? And can you share the AUM also in the official documents? Yeah. So I think uh, the interest income, right, is that that's the interest on uh, interest the, expense. The, yeah, yeah, that's on the income tax, right? Basically, we have paid a short term, uh, a short advance tax, basically, right? Paid a short advance tax. That's you know, uh, that's what we basically essentially done. And on the AUM front, uh, what we expect essentially is that again in uh, in Q four, right, that will show up in the balance sheet. Uh, you know, sometimes we purposely don't and essentially, you know, in the middle of a scale up, we don't want to share these numbers, right? Once it kind of stabilizes, you know, we'll be more confident of sharing that. Uh, it's difficult to share that in the middle of a ramp up because, you know, uh, the number that we share at this point in time won't really be accurate of where we are even today because largely, uh, you know, it's, we're expecting, you know, those numbers to rise essentially, right? Uh, and during this point in time, sometimes what happens is because there's a ramp up and, you know, at the same point in time, we're doing a lot of commercial negotiations with our partners. You know, we really don't want them to know what part of our AUM is, you know, with them, to be very honest. Right. So that's a little bit of, uh, you know, smoke and mirrors, which helps our company, you know, in, in doing these negotiations. But I think, uh, again, uh, you know, to answer your question specifically, right, I think expect, you know, in Q4 for us to display you know exactly what our AUM is, and that will kind of display automatically on the balance sheet as well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Matthew. Uh, moving ahead, we'll be taking questions from Mr. Raghav. Mr. Raghav, you can just ask your question, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Mikhail. Uh... So I first part of my question has been answered. I think we can expect ramp up uh, in the numbers Q4 onwards. Uh, last call you said you have uh, uh, your own funds about uh, 50, 60 odd crores, which will be utilized. So I want to know a sense of how much uh, uh, we have utilized, how much we are left with and any plans for the fundraising. So right now, if we say in one quarter, uh, our AUM has gone 3x. So do you see same speed uh, 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 going on or you, you think that it will slow down and we'll probably settle somewhere around 6x or 10x? Just some sense on uh, the AUM growth and the amount of capital at hand. Yeah, you know, uh, I would say that essentially, uh, you know, without diving into like, you know, actual numbers, right? I think probably a fair estimate that I have is, I would put it in this way, right? Um, I would expect that in the next maybe maximum of three months, I would expect that us for us to basically deploy all the equity that we have, right? Like that's realistic uh, expectation that, you know, internally we have, and that's the kind of targets that we have set for ourselves, right? Uh, you know, there are ambitious targets, but we expect them to be met, right? That's how we primed everything towards. So, so that's to answer, I think your first question. 
i think to uh, think about how do you uh, you know uh, on the capital front right i think our first immediate goal is going to be after that to get you know uh, leverage into the company right uh, so yeah just to be you know categorical on that like we are not looking to basically do any kind of equity uh, injection into the company uh, at this point in time you know it's it's way too early uh, you know uh, our valuations are you know i think uh, very very modest at this point in time so i think we have a long way to go so i think uh, the right way for us to go about doing this will you know be first obviously over the next you know two three months get all of our equity deployed second you know get to you know some kind of leverage essentially you know minimum anywhere between you know 1 to 2x you know debt to equity uh, right which is i think a fair expectation to basically have um and then take it as it comes essentially right like at that point in time we'll see what's the best uh, capital which is required for the company um given that we are also you know i would say decently profitable from an roe perspective uh you know we will be very very smart about the kind of capital we take into the company because you know again for us you know it's very important to grow sustainably with really good return on equity uh, rather than you know you know building a company which you know is giving roes which are basically reflect, reflecting you know sometimes uh, you know other companies which give roes which are you know like fd rates right or sometimes even below that so that doesn't really you know make sense to us so we'll be very very uh, smart about how to take capital inside the company but yeah the focus will always be on delivering like really good roes thanks mikhil and how about the profit margins so uh, any uh, range that you have in mind based on the unit economics we have uh, i think last time you said it will be in higher teens so are we saying it will be around 18 to 25% or more than that i think nothing really changes uh, in terms of you know uh, you know what i had mentioned last time as well you know i expect that to continue happening and hopefully you know our goal is that as we kind of scale up even more you know uh, the margins uh, expand right because obviously i uh, you know when i think about obviously apis right like the more you use them uh, obviously the cheaper it becomes for us and that's where our margins expand further and i think even when it comes to <laughs> capital right the more capital that we end up raising uh, obviously there will be additional nims that we get from it so uh, and obviously the bigger that we get the cheaper the cost of capital ends up becoming for us right so a lot of those things Uh, you know will come into you know fusion and uh, obviously it will be extremely beneficial in terms of margins thanks mikhil Welcome. good luck thank you thanks thanks mr raghav moving ahead we'll be taking questions from mr mukesh kothari hello hey mukesh hi yes hi, absolutely hi. Uh, no, just want to understand one thing. What led to the change in the thought process of moving away or migrating away from uh, LSP model to, say, lending uh, whole lending model with uh, NPFC? I mean, what are the challenges uh, do you see in LSP model? And what would uh, I mean? Would it uh, would the focus be reduced on LSP uh, led model that you have today? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, honestly, I'll tell you. Uh, you know, we've been in this space like almost for now six, seven years, right? And and really, the thought process that we have at this point in time is that, you know, finally, like from an RBI perspective, I think it's to us at least it's very, very clear that, you know, um, they see this space uh, as something that they want very, very tightly regulated. So I think uh, it comes to. you know it comes to basically not only seeing what the guidelines uh, have been kind of uh, you know hinting at but also kind of reading the tea leaves of what what we expect to happen in the future right so like very honestly if you ask me i expect that over the next you know maybe 3 4 years right the largest digital lenders in the country are going to be people with licenses like this is something which you know we internally very strongly believe i think if you're an lsp uh the right move at this point in time is to try and acquire getting you know acquiring a license right because that's going to be uh, or that is in my opinion a very very fundamental pillar so i think uh, it's nothing uh, i wouldn't put it in some way that you know i, I don't think it's a you know i don't think it's the end of lsps at all uh, it's it's not that it's just that from our perspective right given that we are looking to scale essentially right and why are we looking to scale because i think we have all of the information that we need from an underwriting perspective from an evaluation of companies perspective 
you know, to the collection infrastructure that we need to for this to be the right moment. And also what's happened is there's been a lot of consolidation in the space over the last, again, 12 to 18 months, given all the regulatory action. And very honestly, a lot of investors have not shown uh, a lot of support towards LSPs, right? All that action has moved towards NBFCs. So because of all of those things, right? Like essentially the people who are actually looking to scale are also NBFCs. And the beautiful thing about working with, you know, regulated entities is number one, you know, their core business is lending, right? Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, their intent is a lot, lot higher. Uh, and number two, because they are licensed entities themselves, they are very, very, uh, you know, they keep compliance to be very, very important. And the same point in time, uh, because, you know, when you do co-lending, the biggest advantage is, you know, the loans are on both our books, right? So by default, uh, it really, really uh, fortifies, you know, the mentality in terms of both of us wanting to do a really good book, right? Because lending is pretty simple, right? Uh, you give out money, you get back money. And as long as you do that really, really well, you know, somebody comes and gives you money, you know, at a cheap cost so that you continue doing this and scaling up, right? Uh, so I think when you work with other NBFCs who have that same mindset, they want to basically do things right. They want to create a really good book so that their book is really nice. Our book is really nice. Uh, and both of us are profitable, right? Because again, if you're an unprofitable or a low ROV NBFC, I think either you will struggle from a debt perspective or either you will struggle from an equity perspective, right? So I think uh, a lot of those things are coming together. And at the same point in time, I think what we've been able to do is, you know, through the brand that we've created over the last five, six years, you know, or I, actually at this point in time, seven, eight years, right? Uh, how time passes. But but the reality is that, you know, because of the credibility and brand that we have out there, I think everybody at this point in time, you know, whether it's an LSP or an NBFC, uh, wants to work with an Apollo largely because they want the great experience that Apollo offers in terms of tech, you know, the fast go live, etc. right? So all of those things are helping us to pick and choose amongst the best in the best in terms of business, right? And when we're able to do this, it just makes a lot more sense for us to go in with, you know, really large NBFCs out there in the digital lending space who have proven themselves over the last, you know, three, four years, de delivered like profitable years across the last three years, right? Maybe their ROEs aren't, you know, uh, close to what ours are, uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes I can discount that, uh, you know, because of, I guess, you know, their, you know, caps, you know, cap table wanting different things. But, you know, one of the things I find it very difficult to kind of discount is if, you know, you're building a lending company, which is, you know, unit economics negative and not profitable, right? So I think we've been able to actually find a lot of companies uh, which have been in this space and have been performing, you know, decently well over the last three years. You know, uh, again, the standards being that of, you know, a digital lending company, right? Uh, and, and you know, all of those factors coming together, largely the best founder, uh, best teams that we've been finding, the best companies that we've been finding have been NBFCs. And the beautiful thing about them is because of their focus on creating really good books and being compliant about it and their focus being, again, 100% on lending, we just find them to be the most suitable partner at this point in time. And combining that with what RBI thinks, I think, uh, you know, the future seems to be heading, you know, definitely in this direction. Fine, fine. I understand. So what sort of model are you looking at? I mean, is it distribution debt model or uh, co-lending uh, model? This is, I'm just trying to understand because the, if you are doing the co-lending, then you are, uh, uh, I mean, if you're doing distribution, then your margins would be less. And if you're doing co-lending, uh, your ROEs would be less. And what sort of NBFCs are these? I mean, are these listed and listed, uh, I mean, uh, if you can give a, a color of uh, what sort of NBFCs are these NBFCs? I mean, are they into, say, personal loan lending, unsecured lending? Yeah, yeah absolutely, right? So, number one, uh, I would say, you know, pretty much all of the NBFCs that we work with are absolutely, you know, uh, tech-first in nature, right? So, I'm not talking about any legacy NBFCs at this point in time. Uh, you know, the, the DNA remains exactly the same in terms of the kind of partner that we want. We, we look for only companies which are tech first companies because, you know, very honestly, uh, only if you work with tech first companies, will they kind of value tech at the same point in time, right? If you work with like a legacy NBFC, I think given, uh, you know, their uh, their own internal DNA, uh, 
you know being very manual in nature or working in a particular style right like i think very honestly even if they looked at uh, apollo's uh, efficient uh, infrastructure right like i think maybe they would not value it right because only when you know the problem do you value the solution essentially right so i think that's why for us the focus remains exactly the same these are all like tech first nbfcs uh, that we are kind of working with and and they are the ones who honestly you know love working with us as well like you know recently we we onboarded somebody who you know today literally has worked with like 15 20 different nbfcs right and they are an nbfc themselves i think they are uh, systematically important as well with 1000 crore plus aum and they literally said that you know working with the apollo and co lending with you guys was the best experience i've ever had with any lender right uh, and and this person literally has the pick of the bunch right in terms of working uh, with anybody and at the same point in time uh, the portfolio that they've created with us is the best portfolio they have across you know across the table pretty much right and and by any means of imagination apollo is far from the cheapest right uh, and the reason being very simple right you know essentially for them it's not just about cost it's about delivering a great user experience to their best customers right because there's no point delivering a crappy experience to your best customers cuz you know finally money is a commodity and you know if you don't give a good experience uh, this guy is going to take his best customer to another lender right or the or the best customer itself is going to leave this guy and go to another you know digital lender right so they want to make sure that they are servicing these customers really really well and that's why what they want a really good co lending partner for that so definitely our focus by the way to answer your second question is uh, it is on the co lending model that's our big focus uh, you know i think that's where we can basically unlock a lot of those benefits where you know the loan is on both books so that you know it's important really for both people to keep really really clean books and by default that results in a much better portfolio from a dpd perspective so that's that's how we think about it uh, i think in terms of uh, you know our margins etc honestly there's no impact on that at all because i think uh, you know it, as compared to what we used to do we are moving from a non fee led uh, business to a, a interest led business so i think uh, there will be impact on margins uh, there will be uh, reduction in uh, uh, roe for sure uh, because see, because you are consuming capital right uh, when you are lending uh, you are setting aside some portion of capital uh, towards uh, capital depreciation and all that Uh, so i am coming from that perspective but oh, this used to be there before as well though right uh, i think if anything uh, you know the only difference is before honestly like we were not happy with the kind of i think distribution setup of the partners that we had at some point in time uh, given their poor unit economics and that's the frank reason why we never went about and you know uh, deployed the existing capital also that we had because we just weren't confident that they'd be you know these partners were you know doing stuff which made you know financial sense very honestly right for themselves because they themselves weren't profitable and at the same point in time i think there's no point building books which are not great even if apollo was financially covered right which was actually the status you know no, if i, I think mean, i understand that fpd regulations uh, i mean forced you to pay by what they change i understand that I mean that's I know that's very important. So in terms of co lending model, how do you look at it? I mean, what sort of ratio uh, is the typically if a loan is for say hundred uh, rupees, what sort of yeah. uh, participation with uh, will Apollo have uh, with the NPFC? We typically do an eighty twenty where Apollo is the eighty, right, and then the opposite person is a twenty. That's that's how we typically go about doing this. Why would uh, Apollo do a major part of uh, the co lending? Uh, from their books i mean why would uh, see because origination is done by nps and uh, basically the risk uh, credit risk is being undertaken by apollo I mean, i'm just trying to understand uh, i mean how does apollo look at this uh, whole structure yeah so i mean typically in, in any kind of co lending right like this is uh, the way you think about it is you know it's an industry standard right like anybody who's typically doing co lending whoever is usually sourcing the loan ends up putting uh you know a 20% uh, into the loan essentially right and whoever is basically uh, being you know the partner lender right and so in these cases ends up you know putting uh, the 80% that's you know usually the industry standard of how things kind of go right and from our perspective uh, the risk underwriting everything remains exactly same as before right because so i mean there's a risk that uh, the partner resources the loan could end up uh, giving say a bad credit to apollo I mean, his loss would be restricted uh, to twenty percent of the loan that is being lent, and Apollo might be sitting uh, with a higher portion of uh, 
No, not really, because actually what ends up happening is few things, right? Like, uh, number one is we haven't met a single NBFC, by the way, who wants to do any kind of bad loans on their own book, right? If if any NBFC actually wants to do bad loans, it's usually in a BC partnership, right? Uh, but very honestly, even in that case, we, we've never met an NBFC actually, frankly, who wants to do bad loans at all, to be, you know, very blunt about it. But even if I had to, you know, on I'm theory... talking about when cycles change, I mean, not, I mean, today's cycle is good. Uh, I'm talk, I mean, I understand nobody would look at uh, lending bad loans. I'm talking more about say uh, when there's a change in cycle. But I'm not understanding essentially, right? Because it really doesn't matter what kind of loans that they want to do, right? Because finally the underwriting is controlled by me. So, you know, if they end up sending me bad loans, we would just reject all of them. Okay, so it's not a I mean, portfolio led approach. I mean, it's an individual loan to loan approach. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Because see, I mean, essentially you have to do that, right? Uh, you know, uh, at any partnership, right? Like uh, whenever we used to do uh, partnerships, even before, right? Like every single loan, it had to be approved by a policy which is jointly being decided, right? So as an example, I think the only difference right now is the experience for the end customer is really good because what happens in certain cases is that, you know, uh, the you know the the sourcing NBFC, right, may come up with hundred loans. They may pass on 100 loans to Apollo and out of 100 loans, maybe 50 of them are approved by Apollo and 50 are rejected, right? But instead of the customer being rejected, the 50 loans which Apollo rejected, uh, you know, the NBFC, which is the sourcing NBFC, directly ends up giving them the loan by keeping the loan 100% on their book, right? Uh, because, you know, if they are bringing a loan to Apollo, that means they've approved it, right? Now, the only question is whether Apollo approves it or not, right? If Apollo approves it, we'll put in 80% of the money uh, that's point number one. If we reject it, it's rejected, right? Uh, it ends up going to the sourcing NBFC and most likely in our cases, we've noticed that they end up doing the loan on their book, right? Because they, as it is, want to source the loan and, and, and do the loan. Uh, I think the point number two is also the further benefit which happens from a co-lending perspective is that when we do 80-20, right? We actually take first round receivables uh, on the entire 100%, right? Uh, so essentially this makes sure that from a commercial perspective, all the collections which are coming, right, uh, the 80% and the 20%, Apollo has first right on that, right? So that really makes sure that, you know, uh, even beyond uh, the credit policies that we set up, right, uh, we also have further cover in the 20% that they have put in. And realistically speaking, right, like I think we haven't come across any NBFC who's at least done portfolios with us, whose 30 DPD numbers were anything beyond 7%. Right, because the math only doesn't make make sense for them, and it becomes a completely loss making proposition, you know, from their perspective. While you know, we obviously have the twenty percent, which ends up being a first right on receivables that we take. Yeah, I mean, what sort of product are these? I mean, last question. What sort of product? I mean, are these uh, unsecured loans or uh, say consumer loans or uh, what sort of products are these? So these are largely only unsecured loans, right? I think uh, what we've kind of noticed is, is it's very difficult to do for us to actually at this point in time, uh, you know, do a secured lending in a large scale because, you know, by default, when you do secured lending, right, the cost of capital has to, you know, obviously be much lower for the borrower, right? Uh, so we've really not gotten into that space. While we are keeping an eye on it, if we find some, you know, interesting product over there, which we feel is worth for us to obviously go in, learn and, you know, uh, do some pilots over there, we will. And we are actually actively looking at that space as well. We've evaluated as well two, three partners in that space whose, you know, cost of capital matched uh, what our expectations were, right? Uh, but, you know, so far we've not really found somebody who could do secured lending very honestly in a highly scalable manner using technology, right? Because obviously the ticket sizes there tend to be larger and, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, so far we've not been able to find where technology could play a defining factor in secured lending uh, and the capital matching uh, the the rates that we are expecting. And just a suggestion, and in terms of uh, disclosure, I mean, uh, probably, I mean, uh, along with your uh, single page uh, details that you give out, I mean, you can probably disclose more things like uh, number of loans, ticket size of these loans, uh, NPAs uh, and uh, I mean typical all uh, metrics related to the loans. I mean, it's easier for us to understand uh, where is Apollo growing and what sort of risk is Apollo taking. I mean, today we are totally blind in terms of uh, I mean how the business is growing. 
I, I hear you. I mean, this is a lot to do with us being, uh, you know, it's like, I think a few of the cons where I'm, uh, where I'm being honest, right? Like where, uh, of, of you guys being investors in a, in a public company, which also happens to be a startup, right? So I think uh, the only reason why we don't do that, right, is strategic reasons, because, you know, if we display these numbers, right, uh, obviously all the partners that we work with also understand very, very clearly as to, you know, what's the kind of contribution that they have towards their business. And it makes it a situation where, you know, they come back and negotiate harder for us, right? So we'll try and disclose as much as we can without it becoming, you know, uh, a negative influence for the shareholders essentially right like yeah it's great to have all the information but at the same point in time because we are publicly listed right everything becomes available for everybody and it becomes a competitive disadvantage sometimes for us to share a lot of this information so we just have to keep that fine balance in terms of obviously sharing as much as we can but at the same point in time making sure that it doesn't become uh you know just for the short term benefit of seeing these numbers we don't want to become you know we don't we don't want it to become a big big problem for obviously the company to kind of you know tackle and get the best deals out there fine i mean uh, better i mean you can discuss whatever uh, to the extent the competition uh, allows you to i mean in terms of uh, not getting the yes. benefits of I mean, I mean that has been a long request from my side data disclosure is uh, I mean, need to probably uh, increase the data disclosure for uh, shareholders like this. I, mean, I think we've been talking since 2018. I've been very patient in terms of uh, lack of uh, data that uh, being uh, sent out. Anyways, I mean, uh, all the best. Uh, we hope this uh, new pilot helps you uh, grow faster. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mukesh. Thanks, Mikhil. Uh, we'll be taking questions from Mr. Nareen. Mr. Nareen, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, this is, uh, yeah, am I audible? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, my, my question is regarding the fee and commission expenses negative in both the quarters, quarter and the last quarter. Uh, can I know the reason for the same? Sorry, what was the question again? Can you please repeat? Uh, I, I think, think the question was uh, fee and commission expenses is negative in both this quarter and the last quarter. Any reason for the same? Uh, I think, uh, let me just check on this. Uh, Okay, so I think uh, I just checked with the team, right? So I think the answer on that is we had done some extra provisionings in the previous quarter. So I think that's the reason why it's it's negative. Will it continue the same or it will shoot no, up again? We expect that, no, we don't expect that trend to continue. And what was the reason for that? Do you have any visa? Yes, the reason was that we had made some extra provisionings. Right? Uh, and that's the reason why basically uh, you know the numbers have shown up to be negative. Yeah, okay, thank you. Provisioning is usually an approximation, right? And that's that's the reason why uh, given the fact that we're a little bit conservative in nature, that's why we had done extra provisionings back then. But uh, I think uh, you know it's it's got reversed in this quarter. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Mr. Narin. Um, if there are any other questions, you can raise your hand. Further, we'll be taking questions from Mr. Nitin again. This, this would be probably the last question. Um, Mr. Nitin, I'll be unmute. I'll be unmuting you. You can speak now. Uh, Nikhil, sir, how? What's the culture at Apollo? And and how is the compliance is ensured at Apollo? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think, you know, to answer at least, you know, uh, both these questions, right? I think maybe I'll start with the compliance question because that's a little bit of a shorter answer. I think in any company, right, the, the, the thought process, I think it always comes from, 
you know what are we trying to optimize for right so like i think whenever anybody tries to optimize for the short term uh, that's when you take a lot of shortcuts right and especially when it comes to you know compliance ethics and things like that right like i think if you want to build anything for the short term and you're looking to maximize short term profits i think a lot of those things get uh, you know butchered along the way right i think for us the thought process is always that this is like a very very long term project right like this company's existed for the last 35 plus years is going to exist like for the next you know 100 plus years that's how you know we are building this so you know by default it's not such a big thing for us to you know uh, basically essentially you know go on the conservative sides uh, of of you know basically compliance or ethics and things like that right to make sure that we are on the right side of history essentially right so i don't think you know that's something which comes uh, at a very very uh, you know uh, big cost or in in any kind of uh, it just our mindset is basically long term right so i think by default by having that mindset i think it helps us basically build with the right uh, you know right fundamentals essentially right like thing so that answers that question a bit i think from a culture perspective uh, what we try to do right is essentially we try to build basically uh you know first and i mean literally yesterday i was having this conversation with one of the team members right and and i think you know to me at least what's the most important thing is number one is we want obviously want to build uh, you know a great company and a great company obviously is defined by you know things like you know phenomenal results and you know year on year growth and things like that right but i think the most important thing for me is number one like you know building a company which has you know people inside it which are happy right which are happy uh, inside it and you know where people are treated nicely and at the same point in time uh, the teammates actually love each other and like each other where you know they enjoy working with each other right so i think to me that's like foundational right uh, once you have that you combine that with like a really really good team which is you know full of like you know ambitious people really smart people who want to achieve big things in life because i think uh, you require that in any startup right like very honestly i you know i really strongly believe this right if you don't have a good team uh most startups right are destined to fail largely because they are competing against players which are much larger than them have much more capital than them have probably more people than them have more smarter people than them right i think the only way to beat you know uh, or or to be successful as a startup is have like a really small team go after a very specific problem you know solve it really really well but you know the team is the most important thing right and in order you know people keep saying it's important to have a smart team but i think it's most important to have a happy team right a team which is actually you know happy to work with them uh, work with each other and has a positive mindset and that can really change the game because that's how you know one of the question that we always get is like you know how are you guys doing this with like 30 people right where are there is you know there are people in our industry who are you know trying to copy us who have like i don't know 300 400 500 600 people right uh, you know and and they are struggling at this right and then the answer is this right like that basically we try and basically hire people who are really smart you know at the same point time we most importantly hire good people i think that's the first characteristic that we look for in people that are they good human beings right uh, i know sometimes people say that it's fine to work with people you know who may not be you know nice people or who may be like any you know really rude but they're really smart so it's fine at least we don't have that mindset at all like the first most important thing that we look for a person is is this person like a good human being right if that person is a good human being then we try to make sure that that person is smart and then when that person comes in we try and make sure that we are giving them the perfect environment to basically be super successful right because our jobs basically uh, and every manager's job i think in life should be very simple uh, once you hire really smart people and who are good human beings just get out of their way and basically give them the right environment to succeed so we try to do these things basically right and you know thankfully that's how you know magic always ends up happening uh, we built i think you know it it feels like over the last 6 7 or i don't know 7 8 years at this point in time we built multiple teams but every single time you know we built a team it feels like you know the the latest team always seems to be the best team right and i don't think that's an accident right that's an that's just because obviously across us building this we also learn about ourselves you know we learn our strengths and weaknesses we try to improve you know uh, we are also very very young right me and diksha like just 35 36 you know that's very very young uh, for an entrepreneur we have obviously a lot more to go 
i think our team is also very very young you know at, at some point in time uh, you know uh, we inside the company we used to be people uh, who probably the rest of the team had like maybe a 3 4 year gap your age gap right but now that age gap has just become wider and wider right where we sometimes now notice that uh, gone are the days where you know we were interacting with people who were just 3 4 years younger to us but now there is a much larger age gap right sometimes you know 10 plus years right but we sometimes forget that right because you know we're just used to working with people uh, you know and and honestly it also it also you know shows the matter of fact that you know people who are much younger nowadays if you find the right people they are way way more mature and they have a lot more knowledge and experience uh, you know than people used to be able to find before right because i think the internet and you know just people who want to uh, basically be great right there's so many resources for them to kind of learn without actually doing a job that uh, you know sometimes they can come into a job really ready to go right so a lot of these characteristics are there but i think uh, yeah just to answer your question in one simple line i think it all comes from you know having good human beings who are really really smart if you have that i think you know all of the stuff like culture etc takes care of itself essentially right that's how i right kind of answer that question can i ask you a last question yeah please go ahead sir how is the apollo you said one time that apollo is very personal to you how is that uh sorry can you repeat uh you have said one time that apollo is personal to you how is that oh because i mean uh, you know it's uh, you know it's it's the most personal company i've done because obviously it's a company which was started by my dad right like uh, in the 1980s so uh, you know uh, this isn't like you know i mean i don't know how more to describe it right like that's that's the most important thing you know it it becomes kind of like it's not only his legacy right but then now it's going to become you know our legacy as well so it's very important for us to obviously you know uh, do our best and you know deliver you know value to all its participants right right from obviously uh, you know the team members to its uh, you know the shareholders basically have and to the partners that we have right we want to give you know good experience to everybody right because again this isn't a company where you know we're doing this for a few, you know few years and you know uh, disappearing right this is going to be always there uh, right so like you want to do the best job you ever can because this is how you know you will be remembered so so that's that's why it's very important and uh, you know um, that's why you know every time we do really really well it uh, i think makes us you know uh, me and diksha that much more happier because you know again i think you know it's it's very it's very nice to build on something uh, which you know uh, i think you know somebody that was very obviously important you know to me in my life uh, has as obviously you know built in his life so if i can add to it and, and do a good job that will be really nice so in the stage that if you want to as you are seeing lot of startups that are around you will you take any stake in that any startup that you think is it going to be multi fold or something like that so that we can be benefited in the apollo uh right now we are not thinking in that direction i think you know we uh, like you know one of the things that we try to do at apollo is we do limit things but we try to do it really really well uh the problem with doing those things right is i think you need a very different kind of risk appetite and different kind of mindset and different kind of skill set to do those things right i think apollo is is a debt machine right which happens to be really really supercharged with tech right uh, our tech is a differentiator that we can basically you know leverage a very very small group of people to do things which you know 300 people also can't right in other companies i think that's the focus area we want to continue doing this honestly i see so much scope in this space itself that i wouldn't want to dilute what we do and go and do you know these other things which very honestly maybe there are other people who are much smarter than you know all of us to do those things right i never want to dilute our vision or dilute like what we do i rather be known to doing like you know just one thing but doing it amazingly well rather than you know attempting 10 things and you know being uh, average at it right like that's not the goal we want to be amazing we want to be great and the price of greatness is focus right so like uh, that's how we think about it thank you sir thank you yes thank you thank you thank you so much uh, wow that was an interactive session and 
further if there are any questions from any of the investors uh, our team would be acknowledging it you can drop a mail to uh, our team on compliance at the rate apollo of invest.com uh, so yeah that's it thanks mikhil thanks diksha um, i thank all the investors who have joined us uh, looking ahead to more investor call in the coming quarter thanks